Stay free with Russell Brand. See it first on Rumble. But I really want to speak to our fantastic guest who's joining us from The Lever, David Sirota, the Oscar-nominated writer of Don't Look Up and fantastic investigative figure. David, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. David, I wanted to talk to you in particular about the pharmaceutical industry and their practice of reinvesting in their own stocks and shares to manage prices. And my understanding is, is that this is something that they invest more money in even than clinical trials. In fact, it could be said that that's what defines their business model. Am I, um, is, is that correct? Absolutely. Look, the pharmaceutical industry, their business model is to take government money, government subsidies for research and development, uh, and turn them into not only profits, but money for stock buybacks, uh, which enrich shareholders. There was a recent study out that showed that the pharmaceutical industry spends far more money on buying back its own stock to boost its share prices to essentially enrich its shareholders than it does on all of its own research and development. This goes against the story that the pharmaceutical industry tells us when they jack up prices. What they say when they jack up prices, and there were a, a recent slew of price hikes just announced, what they say is they need to uh, recoup the money that they spend on research and development, that, 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 that the price hikes effectively fund scientific and medical research. But what the data actually shows is that those price hikes, uh, far more so, uh, fund the, the enrichment of shareholders, even, and this is an important point, even when the medical research, the R&D for those drugs is funded by the government, aka you, me, and the rest of the public. Even in the event that the research has been funded by the public, they claim that the price hikes are the result of clinical trials and research. So it leaves them in an interesting ethical position, David. Did you see that some of the Twitter file revelations include the uh, repression of activists, activists pushing for a generic vaccine that would bypass their ability to continue to patent and profit from that medication? And if so, what do you th is that a further evidence of what the prevailing and driving mentality is within these corporations? Right. And I, and I think the intellectual property stuff is really a part of this. Uh, if you remember, uh, I think it was a year, must be uh, almost two years ago, uh, the Biden administration uh, announced that it was going to secure a WTO waiver uh, for uh, the IP for COVID vaccines. And we at The Lever reported at the time, by the way, we were the only ones really to go out and say this, but we said, you know, this is going to test the Biden administration's pharmaceutical industry ties about whether they would actually push for that waiver. The waiver was necessary to give other countries access to the vaccine recipes. Uh, and they went to the WTO. And effectively, what happened was uh, the wealthy countries got together uh, and effectively blocked the waivers that poorer developing world countries were asking for waivers that they, those developing world countries said were necessary. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that there are revelations out there about what happened at the WTO and how those waivers uh, were not granted. Now, ultimately, the WTO did come out and say that they granted a, a, a waiver. It was wildly watered down. Uh, it was, I think it was two or at least a year and a half late after the, the pandemic had, had surged across the world. It certainly wasn't the waiver uh, that uh, lots of countries were asking for and that a lot of experts said were needed. IP, intellectual property protections, is are, are in, some, in a lot of cases some of the biggest scams uh, in the pharmaceutical industry in this way. Uh, I go back to talking about the United States here. I mean, the United States has a market in which under the law, you are not allowed as a consumer to purchase medicines from places like Canada or European markets, even though uh, those medicines uh, that are FDA approved are made in factories in those other countries. So a kind of closed market system where, you know, you hear a lot about free trade and the free market, a very closed market system in the United States uh, where the pharmaceutical companies can jack up prices uh, knowing that the consumer can't go anywhere else, and also knowing that the strict IP enforcement uh, makes it much harder for uh, generic companies to produce generic versions of the drug. And here's the key, much harder to produce generic versions of drugs that we, the taxpayers, 
already paid for. Uh, there was a study that came out, I think it was three, four years ago, that found uh, most of the vast majority of FDA approved medicines, uh, the top selling FDA approved medicines in the United States, were originally uh, created with funding from the federal government through the National Institutes of Health. So the business model of the pharmaceutical industry is, let's get lots of money to subsidize our research, then we get to charge whatever prices we want in a closed market where the consumer can't go anywhere else, and in a, a system in which IP enforcement is so tough that generic competitors that could produce the same drugs at a more reasonable price, those can't be produced. I'm astonished that they are able to deploy rhetoric around free markets and uh, entrepreneurialism and individual expertise while simultaneously, simultaneously being so pejorative around aspects of a socialism, welfare, mutual support, when their entire business model is funded by taxpayer dollars until it comes to the moment where profit is extracted, then those roots are forgotten. David, another area that you've spent a lot of time researching and writing about is the evident bifurcation occurring within media spaces and the tailoring of information for particular, uh, uh, shall we say, constituencies. David, I know that the Lever's great work and your storytelling elsewhere has focused on attacking the establishment from the left at this time of divisiveness and division. Do you feel that there's a need and a necessity to bring people together, particularly around issues that demonstrate establishment power in controlling media narratives, uh, an inability and unwillingness to hold the powerful to account? And even, for example, around the pharmaceutical industry, Around the pandemic, numerous narratives have emerged. The story has changed over time, in particular, I would say, around the efficacy of lockdown and those medications. Is it possible without straying into the realms of conspiracy or any information that isn't grounded in clear data to question the way that the pandemic was perhaps utilized to create opportunity for profit, much in the manner that you have described in uh, your previous excellent answer? Look, I, I think we have a situation in media right now where there's more and more use the word bifurcation. I think that's right, where uh, partisan media, media that perceives that its audience are either uh, liberals and Democrats or conservatives and Republicans on, on the other side, that facts are elevated or suppressed based on whether those outlets believe that those facts will satiate or offend the partisan affinities of those audiences. We went through this, uh, just as a separate example, when, when we reported a lot on Pete Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation, when it came to the airlines. We reported that he had been warned for months uh, by state attorneys general to get tougher with the airlines. Our reporting was then elevated by very conservative media, Fox News and the like, because those media outlets saw a chance to attack a, a Democratic Secretary of Transportation. Our reporting was basically it, it omitted, if not suppressed, shadow banned effectively uh, by a corporate and sort of left of center Democratic affiliated media uh, because it was perceived to uh, uh, to, to go too hard uh, on a Democratic regulator in a position of power. Now, the point is, regardless of where you stand on the airline issue, it's a microcosm of a problem where facts cannot be stipulated uh, unless and reported on unless they are seen to placate or uh, a, a, a news outlet's given audience. And the problem with that is that that protects us, uh, th that essentially prevents us from getting to the actual truth of any matter at all. It also protects public officials in positions of power who know that their own constituencies, uh, Pete Buttigieg as, as an example, uh, that, that lots of Democratic voters aren't going to hear very much uh, about what he could have done to better regulate the airlines. This goes across every single issue. And the thing that I'm concerned about, Russell, is that is that we need a media, I mean, this, uh, put it this way, use the the metaphor uh, of a trial. The theory of a trial, uh, of a free and open trial, is that one side, uh, that, that the facts are stipulated, one side uh, interrogates the facts, another side interrogates the facts in a different way, and that brings us closer to the actual truth of the matter. If we're living in a society uh, in which facts are only uh, preference, stipulated, uh, accepted, and debated, if they uh, are seen to, uh, to satisfy one side's political proclivities, uh, and then they're suppressed from the entire other side, 
that doesn't get us closer to a, 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 a stipulated set of facts that we can know then what to do with for policy. That, that goes for COVID policy. That goes for climate policy. That goes for every policy. Stay free with Russell Brand. See it first on Rumble.